basically doing was the first uh, recorded methodology of us rubbing scientifically, <laughs> as science likes that, <laughs> but rubbing something instinctively or intuitively to make us better. Uh, but you've got to go back before that. So when the sun came up, the sun was God, uh, and everything around us, nature, flower, water, it, that, so nature was God. And, and that doesn't detract from, from uh, God-like or, or Christianity or any other religion. What it meant was that ancient man looked at the, 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 the sun and the sky and, and that was God. So he, he would start a salute every morning, it comes up brilliant, we've got another warm day today. So that first stretching out w would be a, a pandiculation. When we wake up, we yawn. Now, a yawn is the, the last remnant of a reflex called pandiculation, which is what animals have to do when they wake up. So when you watch a dog or a cat and it stretches, it's got chains of muscles along its front and along its back called flexors and extensors. And that's what makes them run, the interaction of those muscles. And when they go to sleep, uh, they have to reactivate, recalibrate those muscles with gravity feed. So that they stretch and recalibrate them. Um, as we evolved, we evolved the neocortex brain, which allowed us to override some of those reflex behaviours. Hopefully, and make better ones of them, but I think we, we went wrong somewhere. But, but basically, that's, that, that's the way we are. So we can, we, our last remnant is to yawn. Now, if, if you look at a person uh, who sadly had a stroke, then half of the mouth might be dropped. But if they yawn, or they smile, they can yawn with both hands, and the hand that doesn't normally work will come up. So it shows us another sort of ner nerve system working there, because they can't do it physically. And if they smile, they smile on both sides of the face. So there's something going on there that, that you know, we, we need to look at it in a neurophysiological way. And we have different nervous systems. So we have a nervous system that looks after our, our spine and our spinal muscles. So we can, we can work with that and consciously lift and push and pull and all that sort of thing. And that comes from the neocortex, whereas an animal just does it totally from one reflex uh, movement. Um, and then we have, we have another one that looks after our perception of space, which is our uh, sort of proprioception brain, if you like. And that one's more unconscious and more automatic. But we can still work with it once you understand how these things work. And so when man was instinctual, um, if he had an itch, it wouldn't just be an itch. It would be something that needed attention. If something became hot, you would pay more attention to that. If something became stiff, hopefully you wouldn't even let it become stiff. So daily, he would get up and go through a routine, knowing what sort of terrain he had to go out. So he might have to climb a rope, he might have to uh, vault over a, a, a river with a, with a large stick, he might have to walk in along grass, he might have to walk on uneven surfaces, he might have to climb. So he's not going to go out and injure himself, he's going to prepare himself for the terrain. Now instinct would do that. So he would start to look, and, and the early doing recorded that if you rubbed this point, supposedly your back would felt better. So it became itchy and you rubbed it, because the, 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 the body's made it aware. You've rubbed it in such a way, it might be a hot stone, or it could have been something blunt, or just your fingers, and then you go, up oh, that ache. So they start to make these connections, way before they understood the energy flows. Um, but I'm not sure even how far back that we could actually maybe even see these energy flows. There was a man called, I forget his name, a Japanese man that developed a system called uh, Jin Shin Do, I think it was called. And he, he became very ill and he went, he went out in the, into the wild and he could actually see his meridians and these points and he started to press them and got better. And then he developed a system called Jin Shin Do. So when you look at things like that, uh, when you look at, uh, we talk about being uh, yellow with cowardice or um, purple with rage or green with envy. Was that back in a time when we could actually see our auras and our colour vibrations more? And the more we've used our neocortex, our, this frontal brain, and the more we've focused on visuals, the more those senses have, have di diminished or dormitised. They're still there, but we've dormitised them. An ancient man would have been full of those reflexes. So he wouldn't have waited till he was thirsty and then dug a well. He would know how to smell where the water was. And that's still, you can see an Aborigine in, uh, in, in Australia can smell water. We, we would be out there, we, we wouldn't find the water. An elephant will walk 25 miles to smell water, even more. So all the other animals, when there's droughts, follow the elephants because they can smell the water. You know, a polar bear can smell blood 25 miles away. You know, so that's 100 times more than a dog, and a dog's 100 times more than us. So our olfactory, which is the ne strongest nervous system we've got, we can smell smoke in a fire and things like that, is so dramatised 
because we don't use it. And if we did use it like a dog, we'd drive ourselves mad. You know, you walk through a, a supermarket and smell everyone's aftershave and all those effervescence. It would drive us mad. So we've dormitized them out and dormitized them out and dormitized them out. Now, what you've got to look at is, is ancient man was very instinctual about his needs and, and had to look after himself. There wasn't a doctor. So our first form of healing was, was this doing. And then that was practiced by the, the monks and, and slowly transcribed out and became different systems. So in India, it would become the yogas. Uh, in, in China, it would become the Tai Chi's. Uh, and the pressing would become tuna in, in China. And in Japan, it would be anma, which means push pull on tissue. So it's all about kneading through the tissue. But even just moving muscles has great benefits because it increases circulation and drainage and frees off nerves and so forth. But when you scientifically know where those, those what we call them acupressure points, because we're not going to use anything to pierce them. And so the, the, there were pressure points that reflexogenically healed us because they would become blocked when we were starting to get ill. So you've got to look at uh, the, the body. When it was a, a fetus, it's all folded up. And then it, it divides and divides and divides and divides all the cells. And as the fetus opens up and expands out, then this part was once here. So you can rub a finger and affect the heart. And you might think, well, why? There's not a neural connection to that. But there is an embryological connection. It's all the same tissue because of the biotensegrity. It's all one, one cell with different specializations. So when we rub this point, this, this point can actually be a revival for a person who's had a heart attack. Now, the, the heart meridian actually begins there and comes up. But embryologically, it's also reflexive related. Do, do you understand that? And going back again in, in records, uh, they found a man called uh, Otzi in uh, the, the, the Swiss and Italian Alps. Uh, and he was uh, in frozen snow. And when they found him, he was 5,000 years old. And then they put him in storage for a lot of years. And then scientists eventually started to look at different things. And one of the things they did do was to give him an MRI scan and realise that he had arthritic changes in his spine and pelvis. But also on his body, they found tattoo marks on his feet and hands. And they wondered what these tattoos were. A, A they were interested that people had, were tattooing that far back. But then they went to uh, a therapist, an acupuncturist, and said, if you had somebody with this condition, say spondylosis in the spine or athletic changes, where would you put these needles? And he pointed to the same places that Otzi had the, the marks. So they can only assume one of two things. One, the, the therapist he'd gone to, the acupuncturist or the therapist he'd gone to all those years ago, had told him where it was so he could self-administer. Or when he got to the next town, he'd crossed the Alps and came back down and goes to somebody. That's where they could needle or, or put moxibustion moxi or whatever. But they were on the exact places that would actually treat that. And that was 5,000 years ago. Um, so even, even if there were a self-help place, you go, OK, with your condition, you need to rub this place every morning and make sure it's not, not so. Now, as we, as we mature, it's, it's very easy to get up on a morning and just to check that all your finger joints fold back. So you've got one joint there, one joint there, so you fold them back and you go, oh, that one's tight this morning. But then you could start to look at what meridian comes through there. So it might not be that you've used the hand too much yesterday using a hammer or a tool or overuse or whatever, but it could be. It could also be the very first symptoms of stiffness in a meridian that relates to a particular organ. So that would much, much better precast the changes in the organ if you were to free this off. And eventually that became things like uh, zone therapy and it became hand reflexology and foot reflexology because they realised these points related to reflexogenically to different parts of the body. But the trouble is when you break them all down like that, they become disorientated in, in the holism, in, in its gyron. So you've got to look at, if this was tight and you understood that that was for a particular meridian, for a particular organ, that it could be something you're eating also. So that would make you look into your environment. I might not be drinking enough water. I'm starting to get a kidney tension. And so these points will be tender. Then I might start to get other symptoms. I might get stiffness in the joints because of the dehydration. So you've got to look at that whole picture. And, and doing was that whole picture of encompassing uh, nutrition, the environment, all of those factors. And, and, and even in times of famine or times of war, those illnesses would be endemic to those changes in the environment. Uh, and there was a man called George Oshawa who was very famous for uh, uh, purporting macrobiotics, which is a very balanced yin-yang way of eating. Uh, and eventually he taught someone called Michio Kuchi, who's written books uh, in this century. Uh, and the, the incidence of uh, cancer and things is much more prevalent 
the first books I've got from way back in the 1970s, that you had a 1 in 30 chance of, of getting cancer. And now it's almost 1 in 1. And, and as I've lived the 70 years that I've been on the planet, I've watched diet change, I've watched environmental change, I've watched exercise routines and people doing this for this reason, that reason, and the other reason, and, and not well-being. You know, everybody wants to be fit and look good. And that's not, it doesn't mean to say, you know, there's, a, there's a saying in China, the harder the outside, the softer the inside. And so they do, what, they do exercises to firm up the organs, and the firmer you are inside, the better you are outside. And that's internal and external health. So that's like a doing. It's, it's basically intuitive knowledge of where to rub, but now it's such a science, we can actually show you where these points are and take advantage of them. And they're very therapeutic in keeping as well. It's not a medicine in such that you, 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 you're looking for a diagnosis and a cure. You're looking to heal yourself by bringing out the wellness to make sure that wellness is always a, a bubbling spirit. Uh, and that's, that's the important message. And, and that's always way of moving is, is the natural way and those ways of pressing with that movement is the best form of manual therapy that uh, he'd, he'd come across when he taught us that.